Hello and welcome to Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal, as usual, to help you prepare for the bar exam. Ten questions at a time to that end. We constantly upload content at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell in case you do like this content to ensure that you are updated every time we upload new content. Let's jump right into question number one. Metterly, the owner and fee simple of Brownacre by quick claim deed, conveyed Brownacre to her daughter, Doris, who paid no consideration for the conveyance. The deed was never recorded. About a year after the delivery of the deed, Metterly decided that this gift had been ill-advised. She requested that Doris destroy the deed, which Doris dutifully and voluntarily did. Within the month following the destruction of the deed, Metterly and Doris were killed in a common disaster. Each of the successors in interest claim title to Brownacre. In an appropriate action to determine the title of Brownacre, the probable outcome will be that A. Metterly was the owner of Brownacre because Doris was a donee and therefore could not acquire title by quick claim deed. B. Metterly was the owner of Brownacre because title to Brownacre reverted to her upon the voluntary destruction of the deed by Doris. C. Doris was the owner of Brownacre because her destruction of the deed to Brownacre was under the undue influence of Metterly. Or D, Doris was the owner of Brownacre because the deed was merely evidence of her title and its destruction was insufficient to cause title to pass back to Metterly. Take 10 seconds and think what, choose what you think would be the best answer now. If you chose option D, Doris was the owner of Brownacre because the deed was merely evidence of her title and its destruction was insufficient to cause title to return back to Metterly, you'd be right. A deed transfers legal title to some in interest in property from the seller to the buyer. A deed is not effective to transfer title until it has been delivered by the grantor. In most states, acceptance is presumed unless the grantee has specifically indicated that the intent not to accept the conveyance. Note that the deed is not the title, but rather it merely transfers the title. Here, Metterly conveyed Brownacre to Doris by quick claim deed. This deed transferred Brownacre's title to Doris. When Doris destroyed the deed, even with the intent to pass title back to Metterly, title stayed with Doris since Doris never conveyed Brownacre back to Metterly. Doris will be deemed in possession of title to Brownacre when Metterly and Doris were killed in a common disaster. Thus, the probable outcome of an appropriate action to determine the title to Brownacre will be that Doris was the owner of Brownacre because the deed was merely evidence of her title and its destruction was insufficient to cause title to pass back to Metterly. Let's jump right into question number two. Defendant was tried for robbery. Victim and Worth were the only witnesses called to testify. Victim testified that defendant threatened her with a knife, grabbed her purse, and ran off with it. Worth testified that he saw defendant grab victim's purse and ran away with it, but that he neither saw a knife nor heard any threats. On this evidence, the jury could properly return a verdict of guilty on A. Robbery only, B. Larceny only, C. Either robbery or larceny, or D. Both robbery and larceny. Take 10 seconds. Choose the best choice now. If you chose option C, either robbery or larceny, you'd be correct. Larceny is the wrongful taking and carrying away of another's tangible personal property without consent and with the intent to permanently deprive that person of that property. Robbery is larceny plus force or threat of immediate harm. Since larceny is a part of robbery, a defendant cannot be found guilty of both robbery and larceny. In this case, both victim and worth testified that defendant grabbed victim's purse and ran away with it. This could support a finding of larceny. Victim testified that defendant threatened her with a knife, but Worth testified he neither saw a knife nor heard any threats. If the jury believes victim, then her testimony could support a finding of robbery. However, a defendant cannot be found guilty of both robbery and larceny because larceny is a part of robbery. Therefore, the jury could properly return a verdict of guilty of either robbery or larceny, but not both. Question number three, I know you're doing well to this point. Congress provides by statute that any state that fails to prohibit automobile speeds over 55 miles per hour on highways within the state shall be denied all federal highway construction funding. 
The state of Atlantic, one of the richest and most highway-oriented states in the country, refuses to enact such a statute. The federal statute relating to disbursement of highway funds conditioned on the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit is probably A, unconstitutional, B, constitutional only on the basis of the spending power, C, constitutional only on the basis of the commerce power, or D, constitutional on the basis of both the spending power and the commerce power. Take 10 seconds. I hope you chose the right answer, and D, constitutional, on the basis of both the spending power and the commerce power. Article 1 sets forth the legislative power under the spending clause. Congress may spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare. The commerce clause grants Congress the power to regulate the channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce and other activities that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Under the Tenth Amendment, Congress cannot compel state legislative or regulatory activity, but Congress may induce state action via strings on grants if the conditions are expressly stated and the strings are reasonably related to the protection of the general welfare. Here, a federal statute provides that a state will be denied federal highway construction funding if the state fails to provide or to prohibit automobile speeds of over 55 miles per hour on interstate highways. This is likely a valid use of the Congress's spending power because the speed limit string on the funding is related to highways and is for the general welfare of public safety on the roads. Additionally, this is also a likely valid use of Congress's power to regulate the channels of interstate commerce because these interstate highways connect with other states. So there is a rational basis for concluding that these highways in aggregate substantial substantially affect interstate commerce. Therefore, the federal statute is probably constitutional on the basis of both the spending power and the commerce power under the Constitution. Question number four. Owen contracted to sell a tract of land overly to Painter by general warranty deed. However, at the closing, Painter did not carefully examine the deed and accepted a quit claim deed without covenants of title. Painter later attempted to sell overly to Thompson, who refused to perform because Owens had conveyed an easement for a highway across Overly before Painter bought the property. Painter sued Owens for damages. Which of the following arguments will most likely succeed in Owens' defense? A. The existence of the easement does not violate the contract. B. The mere existence of an easement, which is not being used, does not give rise to a cause of action. C. Painter's cause of action must be based on the deed and not the contract. Or D. The proper remedy is rescission of the deed. Take 10 seconds. Choose the best answer now. If you chose option C, painter's cause of action must be based on the deed and not the contract, you'd be correct. A quick claim deed contains no covenants or promises by the grantor. The implied promise of marketable title at closing stems from the land contract, not from the deed. Upon closing, the deed becomes the operative contract. In this case, Painter accepted Owens' quit claim deed at closing. The deed became the operative contract upon closing, so Painter's cause of action must stem from that deed. Painter has no cause of action under the quit claim deed because it contained no promise that Overly would be free from any easements. Thus, the argument must likely to succeed in Owens' defense is that Painter's cause of action must be based on the deed and not the contract. Question number five, the halfway point in this grouping. The city of Newton adopted an ordinance providing that street demonstrations involving more than 15 persons may not be held in commercial areas during rush hours. Exceptions may be made to the prohibition upon 24-hour advance application to an approval by the state police department. The ordinance also imposes sanctions on any person who shall, without provocation, use or after another, and in his presence, opprobrious words or abusive language tending to cause a breach of the peace. The ordinance has not yet either judicial or administrative interpretation. Which of the following is the strongest argument for the unconstitutionality of both parts of the ordinance on their face? A. No type or prior restraint may be imposed on speech in a public place. B. Laws regulating, by their terms, expressive conduct or speech may not be overbroad or unduly vague. 
C, the, ter- the determination as to whether public gatherings may be lawfully held cannot be vested in the police. Or D, the right of association in public places without interference is assured by the First and Fourteenth Amendment. Take ten seconds. Choose the best choice now. If you chose option B, laws regulating, by their terms, expressive conduct or speech may not be overbroad or unduly vague. You'd be correct. The First Amendment states Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The First Amendment is made applicable to states and local governments due to incorporation by the 14th Amendment. Any law regulating speech must be clear about what is prohibited and what is allowed. A regulation is vague if it is not clear enough that a person of ordinary intelligence can understand what the regulation prohibits. A regulation is overbroad if it punishes speech that is technically constitutionally protected. Here, the Newton Ordinance must comply with the First Amendment, and it is incorporated by the 14th Amendment. The Ordinance is in fact vague because it does not specify what constitutes rush hour, and it does not define what constitutes appropriate words or abusive language. To tell you the truth, I don't even know the definition of that word. People cannot understand what the ordinance is prohibiting because of this vague language. Further, the ordinance is overbroad because it punishes constitutionally protected expressive conduct and speech. Thus, the strongest argument for the unconstitutionality of both parts of the ordinance on their face is that these laws regulating by their terms expressive conduct or speech may not be overbroad or unduly vague. As a result, B is the best option. On to question number six. Lord leased, leased a warehouse building and the lot on which it stood to Taylor for a term of 10 years. The lease contained a clause prohibiting Taylor from subletting his interest. Can Taylor assign his interest under the lease? A. Yes, because restraints on alienation of land are strictly construed. B. Yes, because disabling restraints on alienation of land are invalid. C. No, because the term subletting includes assignment when the term is employed in a lease. Or D. No, because even in the absence of an express prohibition on assignment, a tenant may not assign without the landlord's permission. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. I hope you chose A. Yes, because restraints on alienation of land are strictly construed. Absent any express provision, in the contrary, in the lease, the tenant may freely transfer all or part of their interest in the leasehold to a third party. An assignment is a transfer by the lessee of her entire interest. A sublease occurs when the tenant transfers their rights and obligations to a subtenant for a portion of the term of the lease. The tenant retains the interest in the remaining part of the leasehold term that was not transferred. Here, the lease contained a clause prohibiting Taylor from subletting his interest. However, there was no clause prohibiting Taylor from assigning his interest. Assignments and subleases transfer different types of property interests, so a clause prohibiting subleases will not be construed as also prohibiting assignments. Absent an express pro- provision or prohibiting the assignment, Taylor's free to assign his interest under this lease. As such, Taylor can assign his interest under the lease because restraints on alienation of land are strictly construed. So A is your correct answer. Question number seven. Leonard was the high priest of a small cult of Satan worshippers living in New Arcadia. As a part of the practice of their religious beliefs, a cat was required to be sacrificed to the glory of Satan after a live dissection of the animal in which it endured frightful pain. In the course of such a religious sacrifice, Leonard was arrested on the complaint of a local humane society and charged under a statute punishing cruelty to animals. On appeal, a conviction of Leonard probably will be A. Sustained on the grounds that belief in or worship of Satan does not enjoy constitutional protection. B. Sustained on the grounds that sincere religious belief is not an adequate defense under these facts. C. Overturned on the grounds that the constitutionally guaranteed freedom of religion and its expression was violated. Or D. Overturned on the grounds that the beliefs of the cult members in the need for the sacrifice might be reasonable and their acts was religious. Take 10 seconds. Choose what you believe to be the best answer now.
I really hope for your sake that you chose option B, sustained on the grounds that sincere religious belief is not an adequate defense under these facts. Neutral laws that unintentionally interfere or burden the free exercise of religion when the government is pursuing other objectives of general applicability cannot be challenged under the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. In this case, the statute punishing cruelty to animals is a statute of general applicability. It is not intentionally interfering with the free exercise of religion because it is applied to everyone, regardless of their religion. Leonard is free to believe in whatever he wants to believe. But Leonard will be held accountable for unlawful actions like cruelty to animals, even when his actions stem from his religious beliefs. Therefore, Leonard's conviction will probably be sustained on the grounds that sincere religious belief is not an adequate defense on these facts. Think back to the Charles Manson scenario where he ultimately was charged and the underlying allegations were that in fact the cult was committing crimes against human beings. Of course, the scenario is a bit different. The fact pattern uses animals and the Manson matter used humans. However, ultimately, if the argument were valid, the argument arguably would be valid towards humans as well. And the Practices of a cult like the Manson family would be permissible. So as a result, it's clear that B is the only appropriate answer here. Question number eight. Price sued Derek for injuries Price received in an automobile accident. Price claims Derek was negligent in A. Exceeding the posted speed limit of 35 miles per hour. B. Failing to keep a lookout. And C. Crossing the center line. Bystander. Price's eyewitness testified on cross-examination that Derek was wearing a green sweater at the time of the accident. Derek's counsel calls Wilson to testify that Derek's sweater was blue. Wilson's testimony is A. Admissible as substantive evidence of a material fact. B. Admissible as bearing on bystanders' truthfulness and veracity. C. Inadmissible because it has no bearing on the capacity of bystander to observe. Or D. Inadmissible because it is extrinsic evidence of a collateral matter. Take 10 seconds. Choose the best answer now. Correct answer would be D, inadmissible, because it is extrinsic evidence of a collateral matter. Under the federal rules of evidence, the credibility of a witness may be attacked by any party, including the party calling that very witness. However, Extrinsic evidence of a collateral matter is inadmissible for impeachment. A collateral matter is a fact not material to the issues in the case that says nothing about the witness's credibility other than to contradict the witness. In this case, the central issue of the automobile accident are exceeding the speed limit, failing to keep a lookout, and crossing the center line. On cross-examination, bystander testified that Derek was wearing a green sweater at the time of the accident. This is a collateral matter. Derek's counsel wants to impeach bystander through extrinsic evidence of Wilson's testimony that Derek's sweater was in fact blue. Such extrinsic evidence of a collateral matter is inadmissible. Thus, D is the very best answer option. Question number nine. An appropriate act passed by Congress over the president's veto directs that $1 billion shall be spent by the federal government for the development of a new military weapons system which is available only from the Arms Corporation. On the order of the President, the Secretary of Defense refuses to authorize a contract for purchase of the weapon system. The Arms Corporation sues the Secretary of Defense, alleging an unlawful withholding of these federal funds. The strongest constitutional argument for the Arms Corporation is that A. Passage of an appropriation over a veto makes the spending mandatory. B. Congress's power to appropriate funds include the power to require that the funds will be spent as directed. C. The President's independent constitutional powers do not specifically refer to spending. Or D. The President's power to withhold such funds is limited to cases where foreign affairs are directly involved. Take 10 seconds. Choose the best answer now. I hope you chose option B, Congress's power to appropriate funds includes the power to require that the funds will be spent as directed. Article 1 grants Congress 
the power to spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare. Here, the Appropriations Act passed by Congress directed that $1 billion shall be spent by the federal government for the development of a new military weapons system. Congress can direct spending in this manner because this Appropriations Act is for the common defense and the general welfare. As such, the strongest constitutional argument for the arms corporation is that Congress's power to appropriate funds includes the power to require that the funds will be spent as directed. Question number 10, the final question in this grouping. Price sued Derek for injuries. Price received in an automobile accident. Price claims Derek was negligent in A, exceeding the posted speed limit of 35 miles per hour, B, failing to keep a lookout, and C, crossing the center line. Derek testified in his own behalf that he was going 30 miles per hour. On cross-examination, Price's counsel did not question Derek with regard to his speed. Subsequently, Price's counsel calls officer to testify that in his investigation following the accident, Derek told him he was driving 40 miles per hour. Officer's testimony is A, admissible as a prior inconsistent statement, B, admissible as an admission, C, inadmissible because it lacks a foundation, or D, inadmissible because it is hearsay, not within any exception. Take 10 seconds. Hope you ended on a high note and chose option B, admissible as an admission. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted in that very statement. The hearsay exemptions are admission of a party opponent, vicarious party admissions, and prior statements by a witness. The hearsay exceptions are excited utterance, present sense impression, present state of mind, statements of past or present mental or physical condition made for medical diagnosis or treatment, business records, public records, and judgments of previous convictions. In this case, officer's testimony is hearsay because it is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. However, under the federal rules of evidence, a statement by a party opponent is admissible as a hearsay exemption. As such, the officer's testimony would be admissible as an admission of a party opponent. Again, I hope you ended on a high note and chose option B as your best answer. As always, thank you for joining us on Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. To that end, we upload content regularly at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so you can be updated every time we upload new content.